Okay, so I think I should start. Uh, I want to present another method for solving the Navier-Stokes equations now. So this is such part two, and it's entitled "Mild Solutions." the Navier-Stokes equations. And so the technique I presented in the last three lectures uh, applied to both the Euler equations and the Navier-Stokes equations and involved uh, somehow modifying the equation, regularizing the equation and writing it as a, as a nonlinear ODE in uh, some infinite dimensional function space. Now this time, I will just consider the Navier-Stokes equations, which means that the viscosity cannot be zero. Uh, Laplacian of V, and the viscosity I will set just uh, without loss of generality one. There is a simple rescaling by which you can pass from any positive viscosity to viscosity one. So viscosity is equal to 1 without loss of generality. And, uh, and of course, we have the equation divergence of V is 0. And again, I consider this on, on R. So x is in Rd, and uh, time is positive time with some initial data V0. Okay, and the idea this time is to uh, treat, so the, the, there is the linear part of the equation, where now this is not treated as some extra term, but it's part of the, the linear equation. So I will swap these two terms in the equation. I will write the equation as uh, minus Laplacian of V plus gradient P equals minus V times gradient V. Okay, so viscosity is 1 without loss of generality. And now the, uh, the idea this time is to consider just the linear equation, the linear system, and treat this quadratic part as a perturbation. Idea, uh, treat the V times gradient V term as a, it's a quadratic, perturbation of the linear system dt v plus a uh, minus Laplacian of v plus gradient p is equal to zero, divergence of v equals zero. With the initial data v at time zero should be v zero. So this is this system is called the Stokes system. And it's very close to the heat equation. And so one can write down solutions to this equation by just applying to the, to the heat equation and the Leray projection. And so, I mean, if I want to treat this as a perturbation, I will put it as the right-hand side. So I need to be able to write down, first of all, the solution of the Stokes equation with the right-hand side. So the, f the first step is to solve uh, the equation minus equals f. f is some given function of x and t. And divergence of v is equal to 0 with initial data v at time 0 is v0. <clears throat> so solve the inhomogeneous Stokes problem. And this can be done in, in, in some simple steps. So the, the first step is just to uh, to consider the case where where f is zero. So if f is zero, then the solution of the heat equation will be also the solution of this problem because 
So the initial data has to have zero divergence. That's part of the, I should write it maybe here. So divergence of V0 has to be zero. Otherwise the problem doesn't make sense. And, uh, and so if F is also zero, then the solution, at least a solution, is given by V X T is the convolution of the initial data with the heat kernel and the pressure is zero. Okay, so where this phi t of x is the heat kernel in n dimensions. So it's um, 4 pi t to the power d divided by 2 times the exponential x squared divided by 4t. That's the heat kernel. Okay, so this is the solution of the heat equation on Rn, or A solution. And uh, I just claim that if I take this solution and P0, then, uh, then the equation is satisfied. Well, obviously, the, um, the first equation will be satisfied because P is 0 and F is 0, so I just, I'm just left with the heat equation. The, the divergence of V will also be 0 for any positive time. The only thing to check for this is that if you take the divergence of, of the first equation and f is zero, then we obtain dt of divergence v minus Laplacian of divergence v. Pressure is zero, f is zero. So, the, so we obtain the statement that the divergence of v is also a solution of the heat equation. Okay, but if it was zero at, at the initial time, it, it is zero for all time. Okay, so this is, this is a solution when f is zero. Now, let me consider now the case where f is not zero, but v zero is zero. Case two. Um, f is a function of x and t, and uh, v0 is 0. And also in this case, uh, we obtain the solution of the heat equation, but now it's the, it's the uh, inhomogeneous heat equation. So v x t uh, will be given by the Duhamel formula. So T minus S convolution with F. At, uh, so F is a function of X and T, but I will just, if I write a convolution in space, I will not write the X dependence. So this is a convolution of the function F X S with the heat kernel at time T, S, T minus S ds. This is the Duhamel formula. Or slightly shorter notation is just to just to use the, the sort of semi-group semi-group notation that this is given by by this formula where S T is the heat semi-group. Okay. And so again, by the same principle, we will see that, ah, maybe it's, uh, is it true what I'm writing? So we have to check that the divergence stays zero. Um, in fact, yeah, I should have maybe said, let us, uh, okay, I was a bit too fast. So let's, let's say this is a gradient of some function phi. Divergence zero. So I want I want the divergence of the of v given by this formula to be zero. So
So let's just assume the div divergence of f is zero. <laughs> Okay, well then it's obvious that the divergence of V is just the uh, heat semigroup applied to the divergence of F, which is then zero by assumption. Okay, and the third case is where F is a gradient. So if F is the gradient of a function and v0 is identically zero, then uh, again it's we have a trivial solution which is given by v identically zero and the pressure is equal to phi. It's a trivial solution, right? Because this is now gradient phi I put p equals phi, then that's, and the v is zero, and obviously the divergence of v is also zero. Okay, so these are the three special cases, and the general case is just a superposition. We have a linear equation, so it's just a superposition of these three cases. Uh, superposition of one, two, three, meaning the following. So if I take a general F, then uh, I can use the Helmholtz projection to write F as a divergence-free uh, G plus the gradient of some function phi. Well, so, so G is the Helmholtz projection applied to F plus the gradient of phi. And so, and so the solution will be given by uh, S t of v0 plus the integral in time of S t minus S projection of f at time s ds and the pressure is is this phi okay so uniqueness uh, is an issue that one would have to consider in particular um, because well, first of all, the pressure only appears as a derivative, so it is only determined up to a constant. And so we always have to add the constant of, so there is always some arbitrary constant of, of, uh, of time, t, that we don't know. And, uh, and moreover, one has, to, one has to look at the uniqueness issue of the heat equation. If you have solutions that grow too fast, um, then uh, they, they have to be ruled out somehow. Okay, so now uh, I want to, so this is more or less a formal calculation because I, if, I want to, uh, if I want to do it precisely, I should write down exactly some formula for this uh, um, Helmholtz projection assuming that f is in a certain space. But you can obtain a formula in the following way. So the explicit expression for the kernel here. So this expression. I mean, this is a there is a convolution in, in space, but also the, the, there is the Larray projection. So what I mean is, I want to write this as a convolution in space with an explicit formula for the convolution kernel. And, and so this formula is known as the Ossine kernel. Uh, 
And uh, okay, so what I mean is I want to find the formula for this expression where f, I can now forget that it's a, it's a, it's a function of time also. Just think of a function of space. So for the moment, um, a Schwartz function or fun smooth function with compact support or something like that. Apply the array projection to it, the I2 projection, which we discussed, and then the, the uh, convolution with the heat kernel. And so the, the first observation is that because the divergence commutes with, um, with the convolution of the heat kernel, so it means that I used that already, this fact, that if divergence of V0 is 0, then the divergence of V is also 0. I can put the divergence on the V0 term. For the same reason, the Lerae projection also commutes with the, um, with the heat kernel. So this, is, this can be written as the projection of ST of F, which is the Lerae projection of the convolution with the heat kernel, the function F. And, uh, and now to obtain a formula for P, so what is PF? Well, we have to solve the equation for the potential. Minus Laplacian of U is equal to divergence of F on Rd and set PF to be F plus the gradient of U. Okay, so then uh, you, you see that uh, divergence of PF is divergence of F plus Laplacian of U, which is minus divergence of F. So the divergence of PF is zero. And moreover, by the, by the, um, the weak formulation of the um, equation La minus Laplacian of U equals something, we have for all test functions in H1 that uh, PF with the gradient of phi L2 is just uh, F scalar product with gradient of phi um, plus gradient of U, gradient of phi. And now this is minus divergence of F phi and this is also minus divergence of, or plus divergence of F. Zero. So it means that, that PF is orthogonal to all gradients. And so, so it is a correct solution of the, of the projection problem. And so, so using that, so it means that, that uh, U can be obtained from the convolution with the Newton potential that I will denote by gamma, convolution with divergence of F. So gamma is the fundamental solution of minus Laplacian, so it's the Newton potential. And uh, well, so F is a vector field. I can also somehow pull out the, diver the derivative as usual from the convolution. And uh, or it would be better to write UI, uh, sorry, U is DJ of gamma convolution with fj. And so uh, what I'm interested in is the gradient of u. So the i partial derivative of u is di dj. Um, maybe I put directly the i component of pf. This is f i plus di u, which is, so f, uh, 
can be written as minus Laplacian of the convolution with the Newton potential of f. since we have a fundamental solution, plus di dj of gamma convolution fj. So I can, I can sort of join now, you know, change the, I mean, join these two derivatives with the convolution and write something like this. It's minus delta ij Laplace plus di dj applied to the convolution of, of gamma with fj. So you take the Newton potential of f and apply this derivative in ij. And that gives the um, that gives the Helmholtz projection, and so S T applied to this uh, as I said we can swap it is P applied to the convolution with phi T of F um, and now the so we have the convolution with gamma of the convolution with phi t of the convolution with f. Okay, you can, uh, the convolution is <coughs> associative. As, as, uh, uh, well, you can, you can bracket them in, in uh, arbitrary ways. So this is the same as minus delta ij Laplacian plus di dj applied to the uh, gamma convolution phi t convolution with fj and so this part of the expression is a is a function kij at time t And it's just the, it arises just by, by taking the, uh, the heat kernel, which is a nice function for all positive times. It's a Schwartz class function. It decays uh, very nicely, so you can apply the Newton potential to it, obtain a function which is smooth and take two derivatives. We obtain a smooth function for positive time. Of course, at time zero, things become problematic, but for all positive times, this is a perfectly nice expression, which you can, in principle, even calculate by hand. But that would maybe be too much. Um, the important thing about this Kij is the following. Um, I will not do the calculation, but the, but just tell you, so if you, if you make the, ca the calculation with this integral, then uh, Sorry, what is? P of I? P of I? P F I, I, it's, it's, it's the i-th component of the vector P F at, at the point X T or X. So f is a vector, a vector field. Pf is a vector field. F, the right-hand side, it's a vector field because this is a vector equation. And we take the Lerae projection onto divergence-free vector fields. So Pf is also a vector. So i goes from 1 to, to d. And the same with j. j also goes from 1 to d. And there is a summation in, in J. Okay. okay. Uh, right. So, what I wanted to to, to 
to conclude with is the following. We have now a solution of the Stokes problem, which is written with a convolution with a nice function for positive times. We can even calculate this function. But what's more important, well, the only important thing is that, that this k, so, okay, so we obtain a function of x and t. Well, it's a, it's a function with, uh, which is a tensor, really. It's, it has components i, j. So, k, i, j go from 1 to d. And uh, the only, since I'm going to take a, co so I need to take, uh, well, maybe let me write down the formula so, so that the solution of the Stokes problem can be written as the, the heat semigroup applied to V0 plus uh, the integral in time, the integral in space, and there was a sum in I, uh, in J, sorry. So this should be the ith component, ith component of, uh, of V0. And then here we have kij of x minus y t minus s times f j y s dy ds. Okay, so it's a convolution in space and then a kind of convolution in, in time. Okay, but the shorthand notation to remember is just that it's st v0 plus uh, convolution of the kernel at time t minus s in space with f s ds. Okay. And so uh, what, what uh, I'm interested in is to, is to know when this is going to be a bounded integral. And the, the problem, so as I told you, there is essentially no problem with the convolution with k at zero. Usually with a singular integral, for instance, if I would not have the heat kernel, but directly take the convolution of some function with the Newton potential, I would have to check, at least for the second derivatives, whether the, the integral is a Lebesgue integral, in the sense that at, at, at zero, uh, is there a singularity or not? For this convolution, no such problem arises at zero because I applied first the um, uh, gamma to some very nice function. So this is a smooth function. The only thing I have to check is the, is the decay at infinity, spatial infinity, okay? And uh, that is something you can check. If you have um, a, a smooth Schwartz class function, any smooth, uh, smooth Schwartz class function, um, and apply the, the uh, Newton potential to it, the decay of the Newton potential is of the order x to the minus dimension plus two, okay? And, uh, and so that will be also the decay of the convolution. Or, the, or the, yeah, the decay at infinity. If you take two derivatives, it will be x to minus the dimension, okay? So the important, the, in fact, the only important fact at the end of this calculation is that kt, so for positive time, kt is a smooth function in space with the decay that uh, kx is of order 1 divided by, so it's, it's t plus x squared to the d divided by 2. So in th there is this t which, is, which makes it better at 0. And the derivative satisfies the analogous estimate.
is order 1 divided by t plus x squared to the power d plus 1 divided by 2. And so, in particular, k is not integrable in space because the dk at infinity is exactly 1 divided by x to the power d. Okay, that is not integrable. But the gradient of k is integrable. It has a slightly higher, slightly better dk at infinity, so this is, this is integrable. Integrable, that's, that's important. Okay, so now uh, I want to go back to the Navier-Stokes equation and this will be my f. Okay, so in uh, using this uh, solution of the, of the Stokes equation, I can reformulate the Navier-Stokes equations in the following way. formulation of the Navier-Stokes is that V xt is equal to, it's the solution of the heat operator of the heat, heat, um, heat equation um, plus this convolution uh, here with, with the kernel k of this function. And now, since I know that uh, uh, k does not have very good dk, but uh, derivative of k has very good dk, I can write this term as divergence of v tensor v. Okay, we, we already used that <coughs> in um, deriving energy inequalities. And uh, and then integrating by parts. So moving the, the derivative divergence, which should be here, divergence v tensor v, onto this side. So I can rewrite this as plus integral in time of the gradient of k at time t minus s convolution with v times v. v tensor v at, at time s. Okay, and uh, for the moment, just to be even more abstract, I will just write this as a function of time. So just completely neglect uh, to write the spa spatial dependence, and then this as a bilinear expression, v at time t. So this is the formulation analogous to when you want to solve an ordinary differential equation and you rewrite this as an integral equation. This is the same with the initial data plus the rest, except here already for the integral equation, we've already put somehow the inverse of, um, of the linear part of the equation. So the, the let's say, finite dimensional analog would be the following. Um, if we solve, if we want to solve the equation uh, dt, uh, dx dt, so x dot equals f of x t, uh, then uh, with initial data x0, then we rewrite it as 
x equals x0 plus the integral from 0 to time t of f of x s s ds. That's the usual way of reformulating an ODE. And then use a fixed point argument on, on, uh, on this expression from, from, from the left hand side to the, to the right hand side to get a solution locally in time. Now, our situation is slightly different because this is not just the initial data here. This is the solution of the linear part of the equation. So what we are doing is more closer to something like this. x dot um, plus lambda x equals f of x t, where lambda is some constant, positive constant, and uh, f is quadratic. So let's say f is like order x squared for x close to zero. Okay, so we split, we have the ODE, but we split it to the linear part plus the rest, which should be quadratic at zero. And now here, the way to go from here to here is to somehow, this integral of f is the inverse, so you can think of this as the inverse of ddt, right? The operator ddt, formally speaking. Now here, uh, what, we need to, what we need to do is invert the linear operator, the linear part of the equation. So invert, invert uh, d dt plus lambda. Apply it to f and you get an equation of this form. And now in the, in the ODE setting, um, in the ODE setting, if the initial data so let's say x at time 0 is x0. So we get, get global existence by the fixed point method for the analogous, uh, analogous um, integral equation for small data, for small x0. So x0 close to where we linearized. We linearize around 0. And so here we are, we are doing a, a similar split, a sp similar reformulation. We linearized the Navier-Stokes equations at zero. So at, at zero meaning zero is a solution. And now close to zero, if V is close to zero, then V squared should be small in some sense. That's this part. And now we are, we are planning to apply a fixed point argument by inverting the linear operator. That's, that's this. And the nonlinear part is just here. Okay. Okay, and so <clears throat> we can use, I mean, this is quite a sort of general abstract state, statement, lemma, uh, let so we have to choose our, our Banach spaces carefully, but let script, S, uh, script X be a Banach space. Um, B from X times X to X continuous by linear form. A bilinear or by not bilinear operator. So, so continuous means that we have an estimate of the time of the type, the norm of B is bounded by some constant times the norm of U times the norm of V for all U, V in, in X. Um, then for any capital U in X with um, 4 C times the norm of capital U less than 1. So C is this C. Uh, there exists, okay, the equation 
um, v equals u plus b v v has a unique solution in the set of v in x with norm v less than 1 divided by 2 c, where c is again this c. Okay, so this is the, this is the equation, and of course I want to apply this abstract statement uh, to some Banach space of, of functions in space and time, okay, and start with the so starting with the initial data v0, my capital U will be this, just a heat extension. And then I want to so, uh, find a kind of uh, a solution of v equals L u plus uh, bvv. Okay. And so this is, a, this is a very simple exercise. So proof is, you have to, um, you have to, um, show that the, the, the map T V defined as U plus B V V is a contraction in a in a well chosen space of V's. Okay. Contraction. Okay. And so we are just applying we're just going to apply this lemma, but the whole work goes into choosing this space x. And the, of course, the appropriate space um, of initial data. And OK, so this whole setting leads to a notion of solution for the Navier-Stokes equations called mild solutions. Definition. Um, uh, <coughs> mild solution, okay, so V is called a mild solution of the Navier Stokes equations if this holds holds um, and v is is uh, also in the space of continuous functions with values in some Banach space for some Banach space x um, okay, on which the heat semigroup is strongly continuous and b is well defined. Okay, so I, I have to be able to make sense of the equation. Okay, and so this is, a, this is a, essentially a, um, a theory that is for the moment completely independent of, the, of, the, of energy solutions, of the solutions, the type of solutions we constructed last time. Because we might be able to choose a space X that, uh, that is 
smaller or does not, not uh, or is not included in L2. Okay. So not smaller, bigger. It's not included in L2. So the energy inequality that, uh, that was so central in the, in the previous talks doesn't appear at, at all. Okay, and so the whole, th whole uh, work goes into choosing the little space x. Okay, so the, the setting is that the little space x, well, this, this x, the space of initial data, and uh, script, S, uh, script x is the solution space. that should embed into this space. Okay, so the natural choice is just to take script x to be this space. Cho the nat natural choice is to take this space, but this is not Always a good idea, okay, but, but not, not necessarily best choice. Okay, and so this whole business of choosing the correct space of initial data and the correct space script X is a big industry. It's essentially now uh, known. The v, v0 is just, just the, v0. the v0 has to lie in the space of, in this space. So there are two Banach spaces. Yeah, but I don't understand. This x is like just containing v0 or like? Well, it should be a, sp a Banach space also. But, okay, yeah. So there, are th there is a space of functions that just depend on x, uh -huh. the space, and that's, the, that's this x. And there is a space of functions of space and time. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we want some properties so for the solution, then we say x is that, I mean, normal x is that kind of space. Uh, for the initial, yes, I want to, I want to have a, a, a theorem that says if, if I make a good choice of this space for any element of this space, with sufficiently small norm, I have a unique solution in this space. And, and it's, uh, it's a subset of this space, so then I have a mild solution. Analogous to what I, what, what, um, well it doesn't, okay, it doesn't appear here, but you see here I'm already in the setting of the space-time functions. But in my formulation, I have to start with a space of functions depending on x only. So I need to go from, from the normal x to the script x, that's the heat using the heat semigroup, and then apply a, a fixed point argument in that space. So this x can, for example, be divergence-free vector uh, function? Divergence-free vector fields with some, I mean, Addition. with some norm. It should be, it should be um, a Banach space, so I need to put some norm on it. Okay, so the, the, the aim is to have a statement that, uh, that um, so for some choice of, of x, um, for all v0 in x with v0 norm, uh, x norm of v0 sufficiently small, there exists a global solution, so V, a global mild solution, uh, V in the space of continuous functions from zero to infinity in, in this space. That's one, one type of statement, that's global existence for sufficiently small initial data, 
And I'm using this type of argument, except here I'm in finite dimensions, so there is no norm to consider. It's, uh, it's, it's uh, um, uniquely given. Um, but so here the statement, I mean, this argument gave me a global existence for sufficiently small initial data. Now I'm trying to do that, but I have to say sufficiently small in what norm? Okay, and the second type of statement that would be closer to, to this sort of, um, uh, this, uh, this local existence <coughs> is that for all v0 in x, uh, there exists a time t, capital T, that depends on v0, such that there exists a mild solution v in that space. 0t in x, local existence, depending on the initial data. These are the two type of statements, and uh, the, what, what we need to do is to choose, choose the space of initial data. You see in these statements, the script x doesn't appear, but I want to pass to the script x for the proof. I want to use this lemma. So choose little x and, okay, script x. Although as a natural choice, as a first choice, we could just choose the normal x of initial data and then choose script x to be this space. But I want to show you what type of estimates one has to now consider. And, and as I said, this is a, a big industry. There is tons of results of this type, but there is a kind of general principle and I want to just show you this general principle. So the first thing to consider is, is uh, known as scaling or physicists would call it dimensional analysis. Each norm, you, could, you should think of a norm as somehow measuring the size of, of these functions, of these vector fields, and size depends on, I mean, it will have a dimension, and uh, and so the the concerning the scaling. Uh, if so, the, the the remark is the following: that if v x t is a solution, let's say just formally a, a, a classical solution of the Navier-Stokes equations with initial data uh, v zero. then v lambda x t given by lambda v of lambda x lambda square t is also a solution with initial data okay v lambda x zero is is lambda v zero of lambda x Okay, I don't have the equations written on one of the boards, but you can check by, by just applying you know, derivative in time, derivative in space, twice, and then the V times derivative in V and so on. The pressure, you can, you can guess what it has to be, the P lambda. Okay, now in terms of my uh, mild formulation, uh, if v lambda is defined in this way, then b of, uh, if I have two such functions, u and v, then this is going to be b u v lambda. So you see also that there is this, this invariance. Uh, and, uh, and we should, when we choose our space of initial data, or the space of uh, script X, we should somehow make sure, well, check at least, how it changes with lambda uh, when, we, when we rescale. Okay, so for instance, LP spaces. So, okay, so, so the point is, okay, what I just said, check scaling of uh, norms of 
uh, in space of initial data and the space of, of script x. Okay, and so there are various choices. I can take whatever Banach space of functions and just plug in v lambda and see what I get. And, uh, and for, the, for the sake of the argument, let us imagine that we just discuss homogeneous spaces. Um, well, okay, so for instance, uh, v, let's, let me call this uh, v0 lambda of x. So for instance, the LP norm of uh, v0 lambda, by just a change of variables, what we get is lambda to the 1 minus uh, d over p, v0 in LP. And, um, well, for the capital X, uh, not capital, the uh, script X, of course, it will be the same. So the same thing if I take for the capital X norm, the supremum in time of the LP norm at time T, then it's the same, obviously. Uh, okay, lambda 1 minus d divided by p, v script x norm. Okay, now, basically, okay, I don't want to give more examples of this, but just I would to give one example. Uh, you can, of course, take some Sobolev space of, of initial data, h, s, but then if you want to have uh, some expression like this, that the norm of the rescaled function is lambda to some power times the norm of the uh, initial function, then the space should have to be homogeneous. So, for instance, just the L2 norm of the derivative would be one possibility. And then you can get some positive power of lambda. You can work out what it is. And the rule of thumb is that you might get some negative power here. So, for instance, you see that if... if uh, um, p is less than, the, the, less than the dimension, then this power of lambda will be negative. Whereas if it's bigger than the dimension, then it will be a positive power. If you take a Sobolev space with derivatives, then of course each derivative will give us positive powers of lambda. Okay, so the rule of thumb is a, a stronger space that involves norms of, of, of derivatives and so on, will have a positive power, a weaker space, for instance L2 in three dimensions will have a negative power. And these are known as subcritical and supercritical spaces for the Navier-Stokes equations. So the expression, the expression is the following. So, if uh, v lambda x is lambda to some power alpha of v x, we call x subcritical if the power is uh, negative, sorry, if the power is Positive, okay. critical if the power is zero and supercritical if the power is negative. Okay, the point is the following. Uh, of course, to be slightly more precise, let me put capital T here for the space of, for the solution space. Of course, the initial data does not see how fast, uh, for how long a time I want, to, I want to solve the equation, but I have to choose this space depending on, on, on the time, right? And so, uh, if V is in the space script X, then V lambda, 
just lives, you see, yeah, there's a lambda squared here. So V lambda is in, sorry, X T, then V lambda is in the space X T divided by lambda squared. Okay, so if lambda is, is bigger than one, or big, then uh, the V lambda lives only for a very short time. Now for lambda, if I make lambda big, the solution lives for a very short time, but if I had a, if I had a negative power, you know, I could, I, could, uh, I could change, you know, the norm would get smaller. So I can make, when I want to find, when I want to use this kind of low existence for small initial data, I could, of course, choose uh, lambda so that the norm becomes small, right? By if, if, uh, if alpha is negative, then choose lambda big. But then if I do that, then the solution will only exist for a short time because there is a one over lambda squared here. Whereas in the subcritical setting, I can make uh, the norm small by choosing lambda small because alpha is positive. So in the subcritical case, and if lambda is small, the solution exists even for longer. Okay, so somehow there are two things. I want to get a small norm, but also I want to get a large time for existence. And these two requirements work together in the subcritical case. And they, they, they are incompatible in the supercritical case. On the other hand, I, I, somehow I cannot ex expect that if I let that, that I have a uh, sort of, in the subcritical case, I let lambda go to zero, and then the norm goes to zero, and I have global existence. Somehow, it would be expecting too much. So, so somehow the rule of thumb is that global existence results will only work in critical cases. So expect, expect uh, global existence. only here. And the same way, since there is no free lunch, I will expect that only in a, well, no, okay. So that's why, since there is no free lunch, I expect a global existence result only if I have a critical norm for the, for the X and for the script X. May not. This is just some kind of dimensional analysis, just some kind of first test. But, the, but this test should, is, should tell us that somehow we should look for a critical space. And so, for instance, in the, L, in the LP uh, um, class of spaces, critical is exactly the LD norm of the initial data. Of the V zero, okay. That's then when when the power is zero. Okay, so now I want to uh, at least give one example where one can prove local existence. I don't think I will have time to tell you to give you an example with the critical case, but one example with the subcritical because they are usually easier. And the only tool, analytical tool, that uh, I will use is uh, the Young inequality for convolutions. Since my, my uh, operators, the S and B, are given in terms of convolutions, I just have to estimate convolutions. Okay, so uh, the basic tool or basic uh, calculus tool is the Young's inequality. That if I have two functions, f and g, on on uh, R D, then the L, say L R norm is bounded by 
F in LP, G in LQ of Rd, uh, where 1 plus 1 over R equals 1 over P plus 1 over Q. Okay, and this works for any PQ between 1 and infinity. Okay, you can prove this using, using Hölder, Hölder's inequality. It's a consequence. Okay, so uh, for the subcritical case, let me take as the set of initial data LP with P bigger than D. You see, P bigger than D gives, is, is the subcritical then the uh, exponent is negative. And uh, the script x will be just a space of continuous functions uh, in, in LP. Okay, so the first, since I, so I have the initial data, v0 in this space, and then I want to apply a contraction argument in script X. So the first thing I should do is to make sure that this term, this was the, the capital U, uh, should be in the script X. Okay? And so that's, uh, that's the first application of the, of the Young's inequality. The, the, the heat kernel applied to V0 in LP is bounded by, well, this is a convolution with the, with the heat kernel, L1 times V0 in LP. Right? I'm applying this with, with P equal 1, Q equal P, and R equal P. Okay, and we know that the, the, the uh, heat kernel has, has, no, has integral 1. So this is just equal to P0 in LP. Okay, this in itself proves that uh, this function capital U, defined to be this, U of T, is going to be bounded, so it's in L infinity, uh, with values in LP. To show the continuity, one has to, one has to use something more about, the, about the, the heat equation, namely that, well, for smooth functions, it, it is strongly continuous. So if V0 was also not just in LP, but also smooth, this would be continuous as a function of time and then approximate, because smooth functions are dense in LP. So, uh, so um, approximation plus density of smooth function with compact support in LP gives U in the space, uh, which is our script X. Okay. So this would this this argument doesn't work if p is at infinity uh, if p is at infinity. So here we need p finite, bigger than the dimension and finite. Of course, this doesn't require it to be bigger than the dimension, but that comes now. Um, so here is the expression for b and. I want to prove that uh, B is, uh, has this estimate from script X to script X, okay? So need to show that uh, B, uh, V, V, LP at time T is bounded by some constant times V in LP uh, so, okay, supremum, ah, sorry, V in script X. 
and then supreme moment time. Okay, this would be the script X norm of BVV, but I'm writing it out like this. Okay, so I have, I have a convolution, uh, and I have inside, uh, so convolution of, of the gradient of K, and I don't know if it's still on the board. Yes. I know that the gradient of K has this dk, and I want to take the convolution with v times v. So, first of all, the convolution at time t of this, of this kernel with v times v. in LP can be estimated, again using the Young's inequality, by the convolution, uh, sorry, the gradient of k at time t in some, in some LR times, so I have v times v, v squared in LP can be bounded by uh, v, uh, sorry, I want to get in, uh, ultimately v in LP. So I have v squared in p half would be then the correct choice here in order to then conclude with Cauchy-Schwarz uh, that this is bounded by v lp squared, right? That's the estimate. That would, that would be the estimate that I want to use here. So this is now, a, a, so far, an estimate at, at a fixed time. So It'd be better to write t minus s and s here. And then I still have to integrate in s. Okay, now what is r? What power do I need to put here? I can get it from, from that formula. So 1 plus 1 over p is equal to 1 over r plus 2 over p. So I can calculate r as uh, 1 minus 1 over p. What, what, uh, so p, p over p minus 1, thanks. Okay, now how to, how to do this kind of integrals? And that's the, uh, that's the part that only uses this estimate. Um, so, maybe I put general LR norm, just uh, so at, at, at time t. So this, this is bounded by using, by using this fact, by there is some constant, the constant coming from this capital O, and then the integral on Rd of 1 divided by t plus modulus x squared to the power t plus 1 over 2 uh, to the power r. So that times r dx 1 over r. Okay, that's the LR norm of, of this function and, and the gradient of k is pointwise bounded by that. Now, uh, so I, I will first factorize out the t from this bracket. So let me write this as, uh, in fact, then I can also factorize it out of the integral. So the power of t that I'm factorizing out is exactly the, uh, this power, because there's power r, but then one over r. So it's t to the minus d plus one half, and then this integral, one plus, x squared divided by t to the power d plus 1 over 2 times r dx. And now I can make a change of variables. Replace x by x divided by square root of t. t is positive, so I, this is fine. 
Uh, when you do that, that corresponds to some writing here, square root of t, and then I have to multiply by t to the d divided by 2. Okay? I'm in Rd. And the t to the d divided by 2, I can get, now pull out of the integral and get t to the d divided by 2r. Okay, so overall, uh, then I'm left with some constant, t to the minus d plus 1 over 2 plus d divided by 2r times the integral of 1 over 1 plus x squared to the power d plus 1 over 2 times r dx to the power of 1 over r. Now, this is just some integral. It, it gives me a, a constant. The only thing to check is that it's integrable, but it's, it's, fi it's a finite constant. Uh, if the power of x is, is bigger than d, right? So, if uh, d plus 1 times r is bigger than d, but this is always okay. So, r is bigger than or equal to 1, it's okay. So then it's a finite number, depends on, on, on r and d. So this is a constant, depends on r and d. And then here I factorize out the dependence on t. That's the only thing I'm interested in now, because then I can plug it in to, to, to the integral in time. Okay. So in our case, uh, r is p over p minus 1. And then, okay, maybe I just, you, you make the calculation and you get um, bounded by some constant times the t minus s, that's the time, and then it's to the power uh, minus 1 half d over p plus 1 okay. times v s l p squared. Okay, so now to estimate this integral I, in, 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 uh, on lp, I pull in the, the norm inside the time integral, use this, and then we get uh, we get um, b v, v at time t in LP bounded by some constant and then the integral in time of t minus s to the minus one half d over p plus one ds because I can pull this out in the supremum norm so times v x squared. Okay, and now it's a similar as before when, we, when, I, when I pulled out the, the, the t out of the integral, I do the same trick here. So I can first factorize out t to this power and then replace this by 1 minus s divided by t. Okay, so this is t to the minus one half d over p plus one and then I replace this by one minus s divided by t and then make a change of variables in the integral so replace this by s divided by t then I have to have another power of t to counter that and the integration goes from zero to one so now I replace s, by t by t, s divided by t by s and just get some in some number here uh, and since d okay so now comes the whole point with the with the fact that p is supposed to be bigger than d it means that d divided by p plus 1 is less than 2 so this now this exponent is bigger than minus 1, which means that this uh, function is integrable on 0, 1. 
So this exponent is bigger than minus 1. So this is a finite number. And I'm just left with uh, this exponent, which is, uh, so it's some constant, t to the, so there's 1 minus 1 half, so it's 1 half, 1 minus d over p. So it's a positive, it's a positive exponent of time, because d is, d is uh, less than p. Okay, so this is a positive exponent. And so B V V grows. Okay. And uh, of course what, what I want is that um, if I restrict all my functions to exist on, on a certain fixed time interval, zero capital T. Where I put it? I can put it here. Um, so we obtain that uh, b v v times t supremum over times up to capital T in LP is bounded by 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 this bounded by some constant times capital T to the power of one half, one minus D over P. Uh, times, so if I, if, even if I have UV, UV, UX, VX. And uh, so if you remember the lemma, unfortunately I had to erase it, the condition, so this is, this is the uh, x norm of B U V, and now of course the, the 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 x is only up to time t. So if you remember, the condition in this lemma was that there is this constant. Now the constant depends on time, and if this constant, so the lemma gives that if. Uh, four times this constant, so capital T to this positive power, one minus D over P times the capital U, which in our case is, um, is anyway bounded by the little, the, the, the little V zero in LP is less than one. Then we have a unique solution in, uh, for, for this, operator equation in the space X, okay? There exists a unique solution V in X. And so you see that this gives us, for, for any V0, a short time interval. The time interval, since this is a positive power, will be smaller the larger the V0, for which we have existence of a solution in that time, in, in, in that time interval. Okay? And you, now, so the rule of thumb I told you earlier with this critical, subcritical and so on, you, you see that here. That this is a positive power. Now what would happen if I would take uh, exactly the critical case? In the critical case, of course, eventually I would like to have no power here, right? But I, I'm not able to deduce this, this theorem because along the way I'm using uh, certain estimates on convolutions and they will not be true if d is equal to p. For instance, this is not going to remain finite, this integral. And so there is, there is various tricks to, to overcome this. That is, okay, it's linear, uh, analysis, it's analysis of, of the heat equation, basically, and um, certain uh, involved estimates on convolutions. But uh, I want to just mention one, one thing now at the end. 
So, in principle, one might try to, to, to be more clever. I mean, using Young's inequality is the first thing that comes to my mind. It's not very involved. And if this is, this is just equal to minus one, well, you might hope that with some clever tricks you can avoid that singularity. But it turns out that um, that the, in, in, the, in the critical case, this bilinear operator is not going to be continuous. So there are examples to show that it's not continuous. So it turns out that uh, B x x to x is not continuous for x equals continuous functions on some time interval values in, R, in Ld of Rd. So this would be the critical case. And so the, the, the solution out of this problem, in order to carry out this, this, this kind of general program, is to, is to replace this x by another one, by a smaller space. So the, the, the way out is to replace this CLD, this space, by a smaller space, uh, x, such that um, b on that space is continuous, uh, uh, s uh, uh, so S, S should map the initial data into the space, into this smaller space, the heat, the heat uh, semigroup, and B should also map X into the space of smooth functions. So you see it looks like a subtle difference because eventually I still want to get into this space, but I take a smaller space. So this, oh, these two operators can very well be continuous without this operator from this space times itself to itself to, to be continuous. So, because this is a smaller space, so it means that the norm on this script X is stronger. The stronger norm means that I might be able to control finally uh, the, the, this bilinear term. And there are various choices and um, okay. So, I don't have time to, to explain more about this, but maybe just tell you what is, what is, uh, what is known. So, this whole technique can, can be extended to, so there's a whole hierarchy of, of, of spaces which are all scale invariant and contain each other, and there's a kind of abstract biggest space of, of uh, so I just did this for, for, this, for these LP spaces. LD would be the critical one for the capital X, but there's a larger space. For the very largest space, it turns out that uh, you cannot apply the this whole technique to, to get a local solution, but the largest known one is from, uh, is from 2001, uh, Koch and Tataru, where X is some space of distributions, which is denoted by BMO minus one. It's a space of distributions, it's a much bigger space than Lebesgue spaces. But it still has the same scaling. As, uh, as, uh, to, uh, to, so it's still a scale invariant space in the sense of this power of the lambda is zero. But it's a much bigger space and of course, so the statement is that also with initial data in that space there is a local unique solution to, to, to star. And the other result I, I should mention that goes back to, I, I think, the, the 60s is that in, in uh, two dimensions, in R2, one, so one of the, the critical spaces, well, it would be um, x would be in L2, seems critical. 
right? D is equal to 2 now. And the corresponding space of, uh, of, uh, of script X would not be this space, but it would be L4 in, in time and L4 in space. That you can check is also critical and uh, satisfies these three estimates. And moreover, this space, uh, in this space we have an estimate from the, so the energy estimate gives us an a priori estimate here. So combined with the energy estimate and this, this whole argument in this space, one can prove the global existence of a unique solution, which is then a, the solution. So in 2D, this whole, this whole uh, technique that I presented can be used to, to prove the existence of a, of a unique global solution. In 3D, it doesn't work because there the critical space is, 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 is wrong. It doesn't work with the energy. Okay, so that's it for my part. Thanks.